Ako je njima bači tu na našnjave mojen njegivi njegivi ekdo miglečego stromnes muzeum iš nekadek minu in John Ray Society. Minua miglečego ginua bežaje goma bezdaje. Ningu abaju tu na našnjave mojen ji Arcadians ki abaju tu na našnjave mojen ji ujedno kijan Canada. Minua kvelag abnujeg bežano ma orkni ki abaju tu na našnjave mojen. You guys all followed that, right? <laughs> okay. um, yeah, so I wanted to start by saying thank you to the Stromness Museum uh, and the John Ray Society. John Ray Society. Uh, and I wanted to use a little bit of Ojibwe language. One of the things that really interests me about the fur trade is just how diverse it really was. Um, and lately, reading these Arcadian journals, uh, you, you see that again. And we know that Arcadians, when they worked in the fur trade, would be expected to learn Ojibwe language to conduct the trade. And we also know that uh, some of the men that married Ojibwe women and other native women came home and those languages would be spoken here in Orkney. So just wanted to use that a little bit. I promise not to go uh, on too many long rants in Ojibwe. Uh, I'm a little rusty too, so if there's any Ojibwe speakers in the audience, I'm probably <laughs> just shaking my head in shame. Um, yeah, we know family is really important in the fur trade. Uh, and, and important everywhere, so just kind of acknowledging those Ojibwe families and connections that made their way to Orkney. Uh, the reason I'm kind of, there's some subtle hints to what and when I'm talking about uh, by the title. So I'm calling this the Ojibwe fur trade, uh, kind of to, to limit things. And actually beforehand, let's do an exercise. I'm going to use some vocabulary that I think might get a little confusing. So. Maybe we can all just say these, some of these words together that will help things out. So everybody say Ojibwe. 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 Good. Uh, so Ojibwe is a tribal group from kind of the Great Lakes, but they wound up stretching all the way from Quebec to the Rocky Mountains in Canada. Really big group. Um, another word I want everybody to say is this one, Anishinaabe. 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 All right, that's good. Uh, I'm going to use these terms interchangeably, so that's why I'm just pointing them out to you now so you don't get confused when at the beginning of a sentence I say Ojibwe and at the end I say Anishinaabe. Now the next one down is really hard. If you were able to do Anishinaabe, all you got to do is add a G to the end of it. So Anishinaabe. Anishinaabe. Wow. Yeah, so that's just plural. So I'll use those terms. Anishinaabe is a really interesting word. A lot of First Nations people use Anishinaabe rather than Ojibwe as a name for themselves. The story of this word is that it means like a human being or a person. And supposedly when white folks showed up in Canada, Anishinaabe or Ojibwe people said, oh, no, 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 uh, we're Anishinaabe, they're something else. So it, it came to be a way to identify yourself as native. Uh, and then this other one, miigwech, which I used a lot in the introduction, that just means thank you. So miigwech uh, and we can keep going. So yeah, this Ojibwe I'm using as a, as a way to describe the fur trade I'm speaking of. You know, the fur trade, like here we are in Orkney and it makes total sense to talk about the fur trade uh, because, you know, as people in Stromness maybe know better than anyone, uh, the fur trade touched just about every corner of the globe. So if you're talking about the fur trade, you've got to be a little bit more specific. So by talking about the Ojibwe, we know we're zeroing in on North America. <laughs> um, and the area that we're going to be talking about is kind of the stretch between Lake Superior and Lake Winnipeg and up by Hudson's Bay. Uh, the other clue from the talk is uh, competition with Highlanders and French Canadians. So I'm going to be talking about the Northwest Company a little bit and how they interacted with the Hudson's Bay Company. And I'm guessing that maybe people aren't terribly familiar with the Northwest Company. Has anybody heard of the Northwest Company before? Oh, okay. That's better than I thought. That's cool. Um, so we're going to talk about them. Uh, a fair amount, and that was kind of the, the clue with French Canadians and Highlanders. But yeah, so in my time period, I'm, I'm looking at the 1770s to 1821. Now, by the 1770s, it was clear, uh, the Ojibwe, some Ojibwe had made it clear they wanted trading posts in their territory, kind of close to their wintering grounds and in their villages. Uh, the Northwest Company formed from the traders that were doing that, were going out to these fur trading, or going out to the Ojibwe wintering camps. Uh, the Hudson's Bay Company, was a little bit slower to respond to that. I'm sure you're familiar with Hudson's Bay Company's history, uh, so just really briefly, I'll give you an overview, and it might be interesting to hear kind of how we talk about the HBC uh, in the United States and in Canada. Uh, but yeah, essentially the story is that the Hudson's Bay Company gets a charter in 1670, and then they have you know, claim to all this vast territory in Canada, 
and they're able to conduct the fur trade in anywhere where water drains into it. Uh, that's sort of the story. The Hudson's Bay Company stayed really close to the bay when they had control of the Hudson's of, of the actual bay, uh, having some supply hubs or some main headquarters in like York Factory, Albany House, Moose Factory, and they'd expect Cree people to come up and meet with them until the 1770s when, again, Ojibwe people are saying and other Native people are saying we want post a little bit closer. I'm just going to have to skip through some of these to, to go through it a little bit faster. Um, there's lots of different Native people that are involved in the fur trade. Uh, like in this map of, of Hudson's Bay, all this territory that's supposed to be the Hudson's Bay, we've got Ojibwe, Cree, Sinaboy, Chippewyan, Inuit, um, and lots that I'm probably forgetting that all had kind of claim and negotiated control of that area. Um, the area that we're talking about today is, is mostly Ojibwe. There's still some people that might contend that, but kind of this area here. So the Northwest Company is, uh, they, they form, and they have a, a little bit different approach. You know, we're gonna skip right past that blur. Um, yeah, so the Northwest Company has a different makeup. So it's, they have a lot of French Canadian influence from their, uh, from the old French regime. Uh, they started around 1776, 1775, right around the time of the American Revolution. They've got French Canadians that had been involved in the trade before the French and Indian War, or the Seven Years' War. Um, and a lot of their laborers are French Canadians, but the owners are, are Highland Scots. Most of the owners are kind of have an interesting history where their uh, parents were Jacobites, uh, mostly fighting for the Frasers, uh, kind of all taxmen and, and soldiers for Lord Lovett's uh, Highlander, or Frasers fighting the Jacobite Rebellion. After the Jacobite Rebellion, um, those same group of Jacobites turned into the 78th Fraser Highlanders and wound up fighting King George's Wars. Uh, including the French and Indian War. The French and Indian War, many of them wound up earning land grants in New York. So you've got all of these former Jacobites that wind up moving to New York and kind of getting involved in the fur trade there. Their children go on to found the Northwest Company. Um, so the folks we're going to be talking about a little bit, uh, Simon McTavish, Wayne McGilvery, and Alexander McKenzie, these are all these children of, of Jacobites, or uh, Alexander McKenzie's a little bit different case. Uh, but after the American Revolution broke out, you know, these, these guys were loyalists, so it wasn't a very popular place to be in upstate New York, if you're, even if you're doing the fur trade out in the West. So many of them moved to Montreal and started doing the fur trade in earnest out of Montreal rather than Detroit and, and Albany. Yeah, definitely had a different approach, kind of had a Scottish flavor uh, a little bit more perhaps than the Hudson's Bay Company did. Uh, but then a lot of French Canadians. They're happy to appear as French Canadians and, and Scots and being a little bit different from the, the English. Hudson's Bay Company referred to these guys as Canadian peddlers, uh, which seems pretty diminutive, like uh, just some peddlers from Quebec. Um, and actually, it, it shows up, this is the, the competition, it shows up in the statistical account uh, for the Orkney Islands, one of the reverends in the 17th or the late 18th century talked about how successful the Hudson's Bay Company was until they were checked by the interference of Canadian traders. Um, so the Northwest Company was really able to, to do a pretty, pretty big damage on the Hudson's Bay Company trade because they were going right out uh, to Ojibwe and other native villages. But their approach to trade was a lot different too. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about canoes uh, a bit later, but when they would go out into the bush uh, to, to do these training, they would bring trade goods. They didn't bring much food. In the early days of the Northwesters' time, they barely had enough food to get them kind of along the next river, and they just counted on finding Native people to buy food from, which is pretty different for the Hudson's Bay Company. Um, the, I think I have a here. Um, but yeah, so the, the Northwest Company, the way we, we generally talk about this is that they're at a big disadvantage to the Hudson's Bay Company because the HVC can sail right into that bay and then you're next to all of this prime fur country. Whereas the Northwest Company has to take this long, circuitous route because of that 1670 charter. So they've got a headquarters in Montreal, they've got a headquarters on the far side of Lake Superior. I'm going to take a rest and walk over here. Um, I'm not getting any feedback. Cool. Um, so they've got headquarters out here in Grand Portage and in Montreal. And from Grand Portage, you've got 50 canoes every summer filling up Grand Portage uh, and later Fort William with trade goods. And that meant that the Northwesters were able to get out into these interior trading posts before the Hudson's Bay Company could, even though they had this, in theory, shortcut to the bay. Um, so yeah, the route actually wound up being a little bit faster. 
Uh, a lot of what we talk about in kind of the era that I, I see talked about in the Strongness Museum and kind of the HBC history here, we talk a lot about that York Factory route uh, coming from York Factory. But in the time period we're talking about today, everything was kind of coming on Albany River, or Albany House. So it's a much longer route. You can see the red line there is the route that the Hudson's Bay Company traders would have to take to get to kind of the trading country uh, versus the blue line is the route the Northwest Company was happy to take. So they could get out there quite a bit faster. So coming in with only goods um, and not very much food, it, it might seem like a, a big mistake. Uh, the Hudson's Bay Company had to spend a lot of space bringing food with them. So they're bringing out bacon and oatmeal and flour and peas and potatoes and that kind of thing. The Northwest Company is buying wild rice and pemmican and corn uh, that's being farmed by Ottawa people um, like Michigan and Lake Huron and some of Lake Superior. Lake Superior. Um, by buying food from Native people, for the Ojibwe, that's really tying into an old history for Ojibwe folks. There's a long history of them uh, traveling to buy vegetables. Uh, we've got accounts in the 1730s of Ojibwe or Anishinaabe people traveling all the way out to the Missouri River, which is a long distance to get corn and beans and squash from Mandan. Uh, before then, we know Anishinaabe folks would travel east to Wendat country, kind of Lake Huron, and uh, farther east than that to get vegetables as well. Uh, also, it, it might have kind of showing up without much in the way of food. I think it plays on another Ojibwe value. I don't think the Northwest Company did this on purpose. Uh, this is one of those like happy accidents. But by coming out there without any food, they're really starting from a place of kind of pitifulness. Um, and pity is a really important cultural value in Ojibwe history and society and culture today. Uh, before any kind of prayer or speech, often uh, this confused a lot of fur traders, uh, but these speeches would start by saying, oh, I'm so pitiful. Like, so when a group of Native people come up to a European and say, oh, I'm just pitiful. You've got to pity me. You've got to take pity on me. It seemed like you, you read accounts where like, oh, these people are starving and they're pitiful all the time. But pity in Ojibwe is a pretty complicated um, concept. So let's say this word together. Uh, Joanum. So Joanum. So joenum is a complicated Ojibwe word. It means uh, to pity someone, but it also means to love someone or to bless someone. Uh, so it has all those kind of meanings kind of built into it. So by the Northwest Company showing up without food and always having to ask and kind of beg for food, they're establishing this sort of, oh yeah, that's how you interact with people, is this status of humility and, and poverty um, and pity, being pitiable or, or worthy of blessing and that sort of thing. Um, again, Total accident. The Northwest Company certainly didn't intend to do that, but I think it really worked to their advantage. Uh, more likely, what helped by not bringing food is that nearly daily the Northwest Company was hoping to do some kind of trade or interaction with Native people to get food. And so that's a lot of FaceTime, like a lot of one on one time with Native folks to, to get food. This is a little bit different uh, for the Hudson's Bay Company, of course. Since they're bringing food with them, uh, they don't have that same need for a daily interaction uh, in the 1790s with Native people. They still probably are having quite a few daily interactions, but when we talk about the fur trade, it's really easy to focus too much on Europeans and assume that there was a lot of them. There weren't, right? There's only a handful of Europeans in this vast territory, uh, and so you'd have a post centrally located, and you'd hope to have a couple villages or winter hunting grounds around it that people would come to. So you could go a week without seeing any other person apart from who was living at your trading post for the winter. Um, so for the Northwest Company, going out and getting food is a little bit helpful, or it's a little bit more helpful in that regard. Um, it's also pretty problematic uh, in terms of bringing out trade goods. So um, one Orcadian, John, or James Sutherland, sorry, I have his name wrong here. Uh, but James Sutherland, James Sutherland was an Orcadian working for the Hudson's Bay Company probably since the 1770s. I think that's why we don't have a great sense of where he's from. Uh, the 1780s and 90s, the Hudson's Bay Company started recording what parishes people were from in Orkney or wherever. Um, so his, what we know about him is just that he's from Orkney. Um, but he's complaining at one point, saying, how can we can, you know, oppose this grand company, the Northwest Company, with six bateaux, and two of those are just loaded with provisions. So if you're taking six bateaux, and he's not talking about the big York boats, the big 40 footers, these are a little bit smaller boats. Um, you're already going out there with far less stuff, so it's harder to have that day-to-day -day trade with people and interaction with them. Uh, and of course, 
apart from like, pity, a concept that the Northwest Company certainly did understand was gift giving was really important in Ojibwe culture and history at that time. So uh, by exchanging for food every day, you see accounts of people trading for food and it doesn't really look like a trade necessarily. It's a group of Ojibwe women come out and put a pile of wild rice kind of on a blanket and then the Northwest Company trader comes up and puts a pile of trade goods next to it. It's just like a reciprocal gift. And gifts are good. We give gifts to loved ones and family members. So by having this daily exchange of gifts, like granted they're weighted gifts, but gifts, it's kind of making this family bond uh, or this stick of kinship uh, between those two groups. So that really helped out as well. And again, Orcadians clearly understood that and wanted to do it, but because they were bringing so much food out with them, uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't match what the Northwest Company was, was doing. Um, Another Orcadian, Thomas Miller, who lived up in Edie Parish, uh, he kind of had this complaint when he's competing against this partner in the Northwest Company who has tons of canoes and tons of people. Uh, you can kind of see it here. It's impossible that I can get anything with just my eight men in opposition to these 25 well-supplied with canoes and every other article of trading goods, uh, which makes everything that I, the little I do get very expensive. So by the Northwest Company handing out gifts every time food comes in, every time somebody visits the post, uh, it means that Thomas Miller's having to hand over a lot of trade goods to get any furs, so it's pretty difficult for him. But he certainly understood, and it'd be nice that I could be giving gifts every day. Um, so kind of switching gears to talk about canoes and bateau. Again, great place to talk about this. And Strom Ness, we know everything moves by water, right? Water is how things move in the 18th century, and it was no different from Canada. A uh, problem in Canada is that if you're trying to get into the interior, there's not one continuous waterway. So the area we're talking about, there's a lot of blue. You know, the Great Lakes are wonderful for travel, and there's quite a few rivers and lakes there. But there's no continuous waterway to get out into the interior. For the Northwest Company, just to get from Montreal to Grand Portage, there was 36 portages, 36 times. They'd have to pick all the cargo up uh, and kind of move that way. And this is the same thing for the Hudson's Bay Company. Their route's coming, they had a portage too. Um, so the laborers, these are some images of French Canadian voyageurs that are moving cargo. So they pick up these you know, 90 pound packs, uh, generally two of them. Uh, the 90 pounds is, is kind of the perfect size. It's not easy to lift, but it's manageable. And by standardizing the weight, the voyageurs kind of knew what they were getting into. Um, the second pack actually helps you, like you have 180 pounds on your back, but that second one kind of stops your neck from coming off your head. Um, so it works out pretty well if you've got to move 180 pounds of stuff uh, or more. Yeah, it's, it's, not a, it's not a great way to live, but it is a way to live. Um, and unfortunately, the portage trails are often, like you see a lot of things being moved by barrels. And the perk of a barrel is you can roll it, but not on a rocky and muddy portage trail. Um, but when it came, you know, everybody had to portage. The big difference was, of course, the birch bark canoe. Um, you know, Orcadians and Hudson's Bay Company knew the value of birch bark canoes. So this is a, an image of a, a North canoe or a canoe de Nord. Uh, it's about 25 feet long or so, and it can carry about two tons of cargo. Um, but the perk of this canoe only weighs about two to 300 pounds. So during the fur trade, the Northwest Company expected two men would pick that up on their shoulders and walk it across portage trails. Uh, that meant that you didn't have to have a really well-made path. You could just pick it up and walk it. Um, the bigger canoes that the Northwest Company used to get from uh, Montreal to Grand Portage, that route with the 36 portages, uh, that one was about 40 feet long, called a Montreal canoe, uh, and it weighed about 500 to 600 pounds and could carry uh, four to five tons of cargo nine to 10,000 pounds figure, so lots and lots of weight. Uh, now the Hudson's Bay Company loved these things. They wanted birch bark canoes. They sent uh, Orkney laborers and other people down into the interior to try to find them. They hired one guy uh, from South Ronaldsey Parish that was hired as a canoe builder. The problem is the location. You know, the Hudson's Bay Company is still operating out of this cold Arctic North. There's not a lot of birch bark that grows up there thick enough and, and big enough to make canoes out of. Uh, you really are, are limited to spruce and tamarack, uh, which is why the bateau or the York boat, which I learned in the museum today is maybe uh, from the Orkney Yol boat, uh, was, was used instead. Which you can make in the interior, you can see that there are some images of 
uh, kind of reenactor slash reality TV show that they made in Canada a couple years ago called Quest for the Bay, where they loaded up a York boat and did the, the historic route from Winnipeg up to York Factory. But they're a good boat, you know, they can carry, again, about four, four and a half tons, um, but they weigh 3,000 pounds. So when you get to the portages, they're no fun to move. You can't pick that up and haul it. So the method they've used to portage it, you can see they're, they're kind of pulling back on the boat as they're hauling this thing across the portage. So you have to cut rollers, get the York boat up on top of the rollers, and then they heave the boat across the portage trail using blocks and tackle, um, which is obviously tricky, and it's really easy to have this 3,000 pound boat come crashing down on top of you. Um, the longest portage the Hudson's Bay Company made their men do uh, in that York factory route is this one from the show, The Robinson Portage. And I think it's a little over a mile long. And to, to do that mile long portage, having to set these rollers along the way, and you can kind of get a sense of how many mosquitoes and black flies are surrounding this guy as he's trying to take a break um, from hauling. But to do that labor, uh, to get it across that one mile portage would take them a week, like five to seven days was kind of the norm for hauling the York boats across that portage trail. Um, compare that to the Northwest Company having easy access to good building areas and Ojibwe technology. You can see my buddy Dave Turner here has just got a work for a canoe on his shoulders because that canoe weighs 70 pounds. So just one person can portage that one. Uh, that one's only about probably 16 to 17 feet. Uh, but that was really the sought after technology. That was what people wanted, but it was really hard to get up north. Um, the Northwest Company knew they had an advantage. So we've got an image here of Northwest Company partners coming to, to rendezvous at, Grand Port, at Fort William at that time. Um, but a couple of the, the shareholding partners, Alexander McKenzie and William McGilvery, they kind of cooked up this plan to buy up every birch bark canoe they could find. So there was pretty big canoe yards at Grand Portage uh, in the 1790s that were making canoes. And William McGilvery decided it was a good idea to buy every canoe available and then some, so any competing fur trading companies couldn't find any canoes to, to go out into the interior. Um, but at one point, they were paying for 70 canoes a summer, and they just pay these families that are making canoes up front. And so the canoes were kind of getting lower and lower quality, and fewer and fewer of them were being delivered and, uh, around 1800. He said, that's, that's fine. Let's just go back to winning it. Um, and this is far from the only or the worst kind of skinniving evil trick that the Northwest Company came up with uh, for stopping their competitors. Uh, so let's talk about, kind of switch gears to an, another trading post. Uh, this one is at Portage Dail, I think is how you say that. Um, yeah, so it's a little, little trading post on the Winnipeg River between Lake of the Woods and Lake Winnipeg, you can see there. Uh, and it's an interesting one. We're gonna talk about this, this guy, so we should say their names. So everybody say James Sutherland. James Sutherland, there you go. Yeah, so he's that same Orcadian we were talking about before. We don't know exactly where he's from. But uh, he was hired uh, as a tailor originally, so he was kind of sewing clothes in uh, at Prince of Wales Fort, which is a cool star fort on Hudson's Bay, and wound up kind of working as a carpenter and building several trading posts for the Hudson's Bay Company in his area. And he was sent to Portage Dail to compete with this guy, Latour. I'm going to say Latour. 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 Yeah, so Latour is this French Canadian clerk that works for the Northwest Company in charge of a group of voyageurs, or uh, and they're competing with each other. Sutherland is it's interesting. This is another great example of an Orcadian knowing what is right and not being allowed to do it. Uh, he had built a trading post that looked something like this. He actually left us a blueprint of the post he was building. He had, he had built a trading post with one winter and had pretty good success, got along well with the Ojibwe people there. And then word came down from the higher ups of the company that he needed to go to Portage Dail to compete with this Nor'wester. And so the whole time that uh, as Sutherland kind of paddles or rows past his old post, in his journal, you can tell that he's not happy to be leaving it uh, or, or passing it up. And many of the men that were with him had also built it, so he like handed out an extra grog ration. It was like, oh, let's just salute this old house and hope we have good luck with building the next one. Um, and he's constantly writing these notes in his journal that this isn't gonna go well. Uh, I wish I could stay, because I just had a big group of Ojibwe families say, why are you leaving? You should stay here. This would be a better place to trade. But he had to follow, had to follow the rules of what he was ordered to do and, and go and com 
uh, go and compete against the tour. There's kind of a, a really awesome sense of Sutherland's attitude when he gets to Portage Dayo, to that area. He's trying to find a place to build a post, and he spends three days trying to find an area to grow in that or to build in that rocky country. And he writes in his journal, uh, I paddled around to look for a place to settle on, but can find none. The country so rocky and hilly, and would appear as if God never meant his name to be mentioned here. So we're pretty good at this place and remote, and I don't like it, uh, kind of quote. Uh, when he finally settled on a place, uh, he again puts this little kind of note in, clearly for his bosses to see. Uh, I have 20 reasons for settling here and 19 against it, as I am certain I will not make the trade which I did last year. Um, so not, not too great. So Sutherland actually beat Latour out to this area. So he shows up before the Northwest Company does. He's building his post. And then in comes you know, French Canadian Latour, clerk for the Northwest Company. And immediately Latour greets him, says, hi, how are you doing? It's so great to see you. I see you're building a post. Why don't you just move into mine? I've got space. Seems like a nice gesture. Uh, it's not unheard of. The Northwest Company and Hudson's Bay Company sometimes did you know, share resources. Uh, and you know, in this case, Carlton House, they at least shared one line of their stockade and were right next to each other. Um, but it wouldn't have been impossible, but Sutherland didn't like that idea, so he said, no, uh, I'm not going to move into your post. And Latour said, are you sure that I can't convince you just to move into my post with me? And Sutherland says, no, and Latour says, fine, that's, that's fine. And he sends his voyagers to start dismantling his trading post and move it to where Sutherland was building. So within a day of Latour not being taken up on his offer, he starts making his men kind of build a new post 100 yards from where James Sutherland had constructed. Um, and they didn't, they got along okay. It's, they do some interesting stuff of, of sharing labor, but it, it clearly wasn't a, a great relationship. This is a quick aside. Uh, this post, Carlton House, was run by another Orcadian, uh, James Sanderson, or Sanderson from South Rollins and Parish, and he apparently got along well with the Northwestern next to him. Um, but yeah, signs of Latour and Sutherland getting along well. When Sutherland, Sutherland had to build his entire trading post without a single nail. Uh, a lot of times the tools are sent out with was just, you know, axes. Uh, there's even accounts of some guys taking gardening hoes that they were trading and just sharpening them to use them as adzes to kind of get another tool for building a post. But didn't have a lot of supplies. Um, and as he finished his post, Latour actually gifted him some iron hinges that Sutherland said he wouldn't even have been able to get off. Uh, to get something like that up at Hudson's Bay. Uh, so that was a, a pretty sweet gift, but clearly wasn't going to be uh, a sign for how everything would go. Uh, as the training was going along, there's lots of visiting back and forth. Several of Latour's voyageurs, his laborers, came to Sutherland and complained about their bad treatment and wanted to switch to working for the Hudson's Bay Company, uh, but Sutherland refused to do that. Latour would kind of challenge him to fights. Sutherland had, a cool, had several interesting books with them that Latour would try to buy off of him for exorbitant prices. Um, Sutherland makes it sound like he's not sure Latour can actually read English, so this might just be a power play. At one point, Latour asks Sutherland how much he's paid to do what he's doing, uh, as if he was going to start working for the Hudson's Bay Company, uh, but it really seemed like it was just so he could rub it in Sutherland's face how much more he was being paid uh, than he was. So it wasn't a great relationship. And then as the winter progressed, Latour actually He's sitting there being kind of nice to him in person. Meanwhile, he had sent some of his voyagers uh, farther down south towards Lake of the Woods, and they built like a little outpost. So any Ojibwe people coming up to trade with Sutherland would see a Northwest Company post first. And then he sent some other of his voyagers up to his old post north of Sutherland, so that if they were coming down to trade, they'd see them there first. Uh, once Sutherland figured that out, he sent some of his fellow laborers to build another post across from Latour's. So basically, in this one winter, one winter training season, between Latour and Sutherland, I think they, they built three, if not four, trading posts, which is a lot of work for a very short amount of time. Um, didn't go well. Uh, Sutherland didn't have a good trading season. Latour pretty successfully smashed up uh, all the furs that were available, or most of them that were available. Latour had some other advantages, other than just kind of being sneaky. Um, he had married into the local Ojibwe community, so his Ojibwe wife could go off and do trading on his own. Uh, apparently, this didn't stop Latour from being like really nasty. Uh, there's Ojibwe people complained to Sutherland that Latour was sending 
voyagers to follow Ojibwe folks as they returned to their winter camps, and then they would wait, and when the Ojibwe went out to like check traps, <laughs> they'd rush in and steal their furs, um, and then bring them back, which is pretty bad. Um, which led Sutherland to actually write a letter to the chief shareholder of the Northwest Company complaining about his uh, behavior, and they actually said to him, basically, I'm not allowed to fight him, because the Hudson's Bay Company forbids that I fight you know, these Canadians, but if you send him out here again, we're gonna have problems. Um, and the Northwest Company wound up reassigning the tour. So we're gonna skip past some stuff here. So you're missing out on some more Thomas Miller, out on the Red River, and a, a partner in the Northwest Company getting carried to a canoe. Um, yeah, okay, so I wanna talk about another trading post. So this is an image of uh, a Northwest Company and Hudson's Bay Company opposing trading posts. And you can see kind of similar to uh, Sutherland and Latour, they're, they're right next to each other, kind of side by side. Uh, in this case, they're on opposite sides of the, the river here. Uh, but this is the, the Red River District. This is gonna become a really important area. Uh, the Northwest Company and Hudson's Bay Company actually went to war out in this area, in this war called the Pemmican Wars. Everybody's familiar with the Pemmican Wars? Um, that happened out here. Um, but this is also, at this post, at Pemina Post, is where we hear about the most famous Orcadian uh, in the fur trade, at least in Canada, and that's Isabel Gunn. Uh, we talk about Isabel Gunn a lot in Canada and the United States, uh, but more in Canada, I guess. Uh, but Alexander Henry, the Northwest Company trader, he actually talked about somebody else at uh, Pemina Post several years before Isabel Gunn, Isabel Gunn entered the Red River. Uh, and that's kind of how I wound up reading so many Orcadian trading posts. So we're going to talk about kind of my research just a little bit here. Um, so my research mostly focuses on this person named Oza Windib. It's a hard one. Can we try that one? Oza Windib. Oza Windib, yeah. So Oza Windib was what the Ojibwe would call Nogolkwe, uh, which means to appear as a woman. Uh, nowadays, or since the 1990s, we would call Oza Windib Two-Spirit, which basically means kind of LGBTQ. Um, but Oza Windib is a really interesting person. Uh, she was born the son of a tough Ojibwe war chief in Wishkabug, and at some point decided, you know, started living as a woman, and wound up marrying several men throughout her life, and still acting as an important diplomat. She kind of was the source of a marriage linking two important Anishinaabe communities in her area, kind of a political marriage, as well as you know, several others. She's a really interesting person. And she shows up in Alexander Henry's journal in a couple different fashions. You know, she lives in the area uh, seasonally, so she's trading with Alexander Henry. But people talk about Oza Windham a lot because she's super cool. Um, there's a story that sometime about 20 years prior, Oza Windham, as this important you know, part of her community, was part of a delegation that was invited to go meet with the Dakota, or the Sioux. Uh, the Ojibwe and the Sioux had been at war for about 80 years at that point, and there was occasional efforts to kind of bring a peace. So Oza Windham and this group of Anishinaabe people are going out to have a peace with the Dakota, and it quickly, as soon as the Ojibwe hand over their weapons to kind of go into this area of peace, it becomes clear that this is an ambush. Um, the Dakota kind of <coughs> grab weapons and start firing on the Ojibwe, and the Ojibwe scatter. Oza Windham winds up with a group of people. One Anishinaabe warrior had managed to like punch a Dakota warrior, grab a bow and a handful of arrows, and they were running for the woods, which was a couple miles away at that point. Uh, as they're running with like four or five arrows, Dakota warriors start following them and shooting arrows after them. Now Oza Windham was a super fast runner, so she snatches up the bow and arrows from her friend and says, you guys keep running, I'm not afraid, I'll hold them off. So Oza Windham has these five arrows, these Dakota warriors are, are crowding in, and so she starts shooting arrows at these Dakota to slow them down. She's only got like four or five arrows. So she's shooting at them, they slow down, and then they start shooting arrows back at her, and she's able to just kind of dodge those arrows coming in and then grab them up and shoot them back uh, at the Dakota. And she does that until the Dakota get too close to being able to surround her, and then she grabs up another handful of arrows and sprints to catch up with her, very slow friends, apparently, because this happens about six times before they're able to, to get to the woods. But she's able to do that, to kind of hold the Dakota off, gather up these arrows that are being fired at her, and her friends escape to safety. So 20 to 15 years after the story had, after this had happened, Anishinaabe and Ojibwe people at Alexander Henry's post on Pemina were talking about it all the time. Uh, it often came up as like, there's this cool thing that happened. 
You know, it's essentially like catching an arrow out of the sky and shooting it back at somebody. Uh, so she was pretty famous. So Pemina Post is also where Isabel Gunn was from. Uh, it's clear for Oza Wyndham that she was a, a vital part of the community. She was valued, she was respected. Uh, her choices were, were good, people accepted them. Uh, her, you know, her dad was a Ojibwe war chief. Uh, her brother, Wishkobug, kind of inherited his father's name, wound up also being thought of as kind of a head chief of that band. This is a portrait of her brother. We don't have any images of Rosa Wyndham. Um, but yeah, so by the time Benjamin Fubister or Isabel Gunn showed up at the Red River, it's possible that Oza Wyndham still lived there. Uh, if Oza Wyndham didn't live there, it seems very likely that stories still would have been told about that incident. So uh, John Fubister or, or Isabel Gunn would have heard about that. Um, I'm assuming you all know a little bit about Isabel Gunn, but essentially, Isabel Gunn signed up as John Fubister to work for the Hudson's Bay Company, and for more than a year, worked as a man. Uh, dressed as a man, did all the same labor of hauling, you know, goods, these 180 pound packs of cargo, and hauling York boats or bateau and canoes uh, across portage trails. Uh, and then in 1807, in December, she winds up giving birth to a baby. And at that point, she's no longer really able to live as a woman. And I think this, or live as a man, and this is where it gets a little bit interesting or, or tricky for me to kind of understand. We don't know what Isabel Gunn's motivations are. There's not a lot. We don't have, I don't think we have anything written from her. It's just other people describing her motivations. It wasn't uncommon, it wasn't terribly uncommon for women to dress as men in the 18th and 19th century. There was many reasons to do that, uh, a way to ex, you know, get away from kind of rigid patriarchies and legal systems like coverture, so you had a chance at some kind of wealth or uh, you know, escape from things. And often, when men would find out about women dressing as men, it was like obvious. They're like, well, of course you would. Like, it's great being a man. I totally understand why women would do this. So uh, it's fine. Just put your skirt back on, and you know, we're not going to punish you much for it. Sometimes there were much worse things that happened, but often that was the response in other places in the Atlantic world. But once Isabel gave birth, she wasn't able to go back to you know, working as a man. Didn't seem to be pleased with her, her new work assignment at York Factory as seemingly just doing laundry. So she winds up returning to Straw Mats. Uh, winds up returning to, to Orkney anyway. Um, she isn't in the records much. Uh, she's in a census in the 1820s as living in kind of a poor house or a woman's house in Straw Mats. And we know she dies in poverty uh, sometime in the 1860s. Again, I don't really know what to make of this. She's got a child, the father never acknowledged his responsibility, so that would put her at kind of a vulnerable position. So maybe she wasn't welcomed home to her family because of that, or maybe she lived in poverty because that was a sign of kind of the changing times. Uh, in 1821, it was sort of bad things happened, both for Acadians and the Hudson's and Ojibwe people. Uh, the Northwest Company and the Hudson's Bay Company merged. So, Wealthy guys uh, in London and Montreal agreed that, you know, we could make more money if we worked together. And for Orkney, what that meant was, you know, well, the 1770s to 18 teens, 75 to 80 percent of the workforce of the Hudson's Bay Company was Orcadian. After 1821, now all of a sudden, you've got all of these Northwest Company employees, these French Canadians, there's lots of labor coming out of Montreal um, and the Trois-Rivières area. So there's more, more people working for the, the fur trade for the Hudson's Bay Company. It's not just going to be Orcadians anymore. And for Ojibwe people, this is obviously pretty bad. Um, when both companies existed, they were able to kind of play the companies off one another. So you could complain to the Hudson's Bay Company about how nasty the Northwesters are, or complain to the Northwesters about how bad the HBC is, and hopefully kind of negotiate better deals there, or the opposite, say, man, John Sutherland, James Sutherland just gave me the best deal on this blanket, you know, I'm gonna stay over there, you better give me something good. And you can't do that anymore uh, when there's only one company. So 1821 is pretty bad uh, for lots of people. Um, it wasn't all bad for people that returned to Strom Ness. If you read through the statistical accounts of Orkney, it is filled with people talking about every parish and how men are just constantly getting drained off to go and work for the Hudson's Bay Company. And several of them, you can, you can read these reverends and various people that are writing it, they're like, ah, all the men are gone. But you know, at least they're making money and doing some honest work and it's better than going out to fight the war, I suppose. Um, and you get individual stories of 
uh, Hudson Bay then coming back and buying family farms that had been lost because of high rents or debts, and they're buying back kind of family farm areas. Um, then you've got some people that make a lot of money, uh, like William Thomason, who Jeannie was pointing out to me earlier today, his school still stands, I'm gonna go check that out tomorrow, uh, in South Ronaldsey. Um, so yeah, so he actually sent a lot of money back to operate a school uh, in Orkney for, for students. So, um, so there's, there's some good stories. It's interesting to me, there's a, there's a pretty stark difference between Orkanians returning and these Northwest Company Highlanders. I'm gonna skip past William McGilvery, um, but you can see this is the kind of fancy estate he built in Mull. I'm gonna focus on Simon McTavish instead, kind of for a conclusion here. It's not a terribly fair in comparison to uh, look at Simon McTavish versus somebody like Isabel Gunn or even William Thomason. You know, McTavish is a chief shareholder for the Northwest Company. He's a super wealthy guy. But he, because maybe it's because he's got more money, but he doesn't do what Thomason does. He doesn't do what those Orcadians do where they buy their family farm. Uh, McTavish was born in kind of a, a farm in Strathair, just kind of on the southeast side of Loch Ness. Um, that stone building kind of right there is the house that he was born in, a place called Garthbeck. Uh, and he didn't, he didn't return there. He wound up making a ton of money uh, in the fur trade, and he didn't return to Garthbeck, didn't buy the family estate, uh, didn't kind of run his life as a laird there. Uh, he instead planned to retire to this place on the Crinan Canal. Uh, now it's on the Crinan Canal, come Dunnerdry. Uh, Dunnardry, kind of similar to Arcadians, I'm kind of standing here piping right where Dunnardry used to be uh, on the Crimean Canal. Uh, but similar to what the Arcadians uh, were doing, he was buying kind of an old family estate that had been lost, but Simon McTavish's family hadn't been to that area in centuries, so it's a little bit of a stretch. Um, but that area had just been lost within a couple decades because of debts to some other people, so he kind of bought up this land, and that's where he had planned to retire. So trying to figure out why you know, Simon McTavish doesn't return to Garth Begg, William McGillary doesn't return to Loch Moore. Like, why are these Highlanders not returning to the area that they were from? And just like the statistical account shed some light on that for Orkney, I think it really it says some interesting things about Highlanders and the Northwest Company. Um, the statistical account for Strathairic says that, well, first off, there's way too many whiskey shops. There's just whiskey dens everywhere, you're drinking too much whiskey. Um, but all the people of Strathairic, they have no respect for a merchant. The only person they like is a farmer and a soldier. So I think William McGilvery and Simon McTavish and who these wealthy Highlanders from the Northwest Company probably knew or didn't think they'd be welcomed back terribly well there. Uh, so buying some old ancestral clan history kind of family estate might be the way to do it. So, you know, I've said this is a competition, right? This is the Orcadians, Highlanders, and French Canadians and the competition for the Ojibwe fur trade. So if there's a competition, it feels like there should be a winner. Um, at the time of the merger in 1821, the Northwest Company had more employees, more posts. They had been more successful in, in taking out furs by, by far than the Hudson's Bay Company. But not many people have heard of the Northwest Company, whereas the Hudson's Bay Company still exists today. You still talk about it. You can still go to a Bay store in Winnipeg or in Toronto and, and buy some things. Um, so maybe they won, but I think really, rather than a winner, the surprising thing here is the, the perseverance, like the really shocking perseverance of the beaver. Uh, hundreds of thousands of beavers were killed every year in the fur trade, uh, and they still kind of paddle around uh, and, and dominate the, the lakes and rivers of uh, vast parts of Canada. Now, interestingly, this beaver is not a Canadian beaver. Uh, this is a Scottish beaver. So. Um, a really interesting thing to me, if you are familiar with kind of southern geography down in Argyle, talking about the Crinan Canal, you might already know this. Um, but if you go and hike, the Napdale Forest uh, is kind of adjoining to Dunnardry, the spot where Simon McTavish, the wealthiest Canadian that made all this money in the fur trade, that is where they reintroduced the Scottish beaver. Kind of unbeknownst to them, I think, uh, but at this point, the Scottish beaver has taken off and is certainly chewing down trees um, where Simon McTavish was hopefully going to retire. So if you take yourself on a jaunt way down south to Argyle, you can go hike and see Scottish beaver and think of ironies uh, of some sort or the other. 
Uh, uh, oh, so miigwech uh, Thank you, everybody, for coming and hearing me speak. And it's been a really long goal of mine to talk about the fur trade in Scotland and in Orkney in particular. So thank you very much. Hopefully there's some time for questions and answers.